Coming up on Tech News Today, how many iPads are coming? I don't know, but they're probably coming March 7th. We'll explain. Also, the Yahoo Alibaba deal is off. Is it angrily off? Well, there's a proxy fight involved. And why you'll pay for free TV. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Tuesday, St. Valentine's Day, February 14th, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website or blog for your loved one. For a free trial and 15% off your new account for six months, go to Squarespace.com and use the offer code TNT2. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zachter. And I'm Jason Howell. And this is the show where we kick around the tech news of the day, try to make some sense of it all. Uh, for Valentine's Day, uh, our gift to Sarah was to let her stay home. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I'm very festive. I'm wearing red and white. I didn't want you guys to feel like I wasn't going to try, even though I'm just remote today. But thank you for bearing with me. I'm going to take a little boat tour in a couple of hours. Oh, and I fun. didn't think I'd have time to do it all. So you guys were the first ones to go. No worries. No worries. Also, our other <laughs> Valentine's Day gift is Chris Knoll, editor of the Intuit Small Business Blog, joins us. Hey, Chris. Hey, Chris. Howdy. Welcome no back. No tours for me, I'm afraid, but thank you for having me on the show again. We will give you a tour of tech news. Maybe a bicycle tour later. instead. <laughs> uh, Wall Street Journal starts us off claiming that the next iPad will be capable of LTE, according to people familiar with the matter. Those guys know everything. They do. Uh, LTE from Verizon and AT&T in the next iPad. Uh, Wall Street Journal also claiming that Apple actively testing an 8-inch version of the iPad. So let's start with the LTE. That's not a shocker, but I, Apple usually does take a little longer to dive into the LTE pool. Does it make sense for them to dive in first with the iPad? Well, definitely. The iPad's got the larger battery, and that's been a big concern for Apple when it comes to technologies. That's why they didn't include 3G with their first iPhone. It's why they moved to 3G with the second one, because the technology moved fast enough that you could survive a, well, I wouldn't say a full day on a, on a charge. But when it comes to the iPad, it's got that massive battery in there, and it definitely has the space to have an LTE antenna. Plus, since AT&T and Verizon both, well, Verizon's got their really good LTE network, a very well-covered area, and AT&T's got their own LTE, it makes more sense just to go with that right now. About a year ago, around this time, when um, when the iPhone came to Verizon, Tim Cook was quoted as saying, LTE doesn't make sense for us yet because we don't want to compromise on our design, and we'd have to do too much of that in order to be LTE capable, you know, thicker, more uh, bigger battery, and it would, it would screw up the way that it looks. I think that with the iPad, I mean, if it got a little thicker, I don't know that it would be the end of the world, but I don't think that they can compromise much on battery life because that's one of the big selling points of the iPad. That's why people, uh, not only do they like the ecosystem, but they like the fact that the battery life is really, really good. So if they have been able to figure out how to not compromise on their design um, and have a battery that can support LTE, if you're in an LTE-supported area, then, yeah, this makes sense to me. Yeah, I, I would say even if battery life goes down by a half an hour, you're going to hear a lot of complaints. And that was what happened when the iPhone 3G came out. Um, they allegedly fixed all the battery problems, but still there was a little bit of a, a hit to battery life and people started complaining about it. Everyone's yeah. forgotten that now, but, uh, but it will happen. Well, and that's the key, right? Apple doesn't care if you complain for a while, as long as you forget about it later and buy the next <laughs> model. Uh, Wall Street Journal, as I mentioned, claiming that Apple actively is testing an 8-inch version of the iPad with screen resolution similar to the current iPad. So you would just scale down from the possible retina display that's coming out to a smaller iPad that's around 8 inches. Officials at some of Apple's suppliers say Apple is showing them screen designs for the new device with a screen size of around 8 inches. Taiwan-based AU Optronics and LG Display are the two companies mentioned by Wall Street Journal. And this would not be something we would see soon, I wouldn't think. If they're just showing screen sizes to manufacturers, they may not even be planning to build this yet. They may be just finding out, okay, how much is it going to cost you to make these screens? We've gotten to the point where we're doing the cost-benefit analysis. Uh, our, our, once you tell us what you can do with these screen sizes, we'll decide whether we're going to build one or not. I mean, Apple's famous for testing out lots of different things. I think in one of the books, they explained how 
for packages, they had like 500 designs for the iPhone packaging. So for them to test out different kinds of, of models and makes of the iPad or iPod touches or any of that thing wouldn't seem very uncharacteristic of Apple. Whether it's going to come to market as iPad 3, probably not. It'll just probably be long-term planning, or they might decide to never do it. I mean, it's it's the 9.7-inch display is pretty good. They still have that small iPod touch, and they don't. it's not like Apple necessarily to go for that weird middle ground kind of thing they don't they don't do that with laptops they go look this is what we got these are your options that's it so it would be a little unusual for them to diversify in that kind of way although i sort of felt that way i as about the 11 inch macbook air good point uh, when it first came out i was like too small too weird too in between and the people who have them love them um it, you know they're light they're portable they 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 offer something that no other uh laptop and that line offers and again I, I mean with laptops it's like the more the merrier really they've just been in the in the um on the scene for so long it doesn't really make sense to me that apple would make an eight inch tablet especially if they're about to roll out uh, something that um, is spec heavy that's really going to wow people the resolution and, and 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 speed and power it seems like a it seems like a step back for apple well apple did say something like they famously i think it was steve jobs saying like if anyone's going to cannibalize our business it should be us so the thing is they're losing out to seven inch other tablets that have the seven inch or eight inch displays Are they? well i mean the thing is it's a 200 dollars price point right they don't have that kind how of how many people are buying it what the fires or the playbooks yeah, or the or the, I'm, I'm the tabs the out Samsung there? Galaxy tab I mean, there are there that, are yeah. a number of competitors where if Apple's going to lose money, they might as well just make it up in the other in their other areas. Just kind of like when they came out with the iPod Mini, people were like, why would you do that? You're going to cannibalize iPod sales. They go, we don't care. We would rather have the money from the iPod Mini. Then they kill that with the Nano and, and so on. Yeah, and this is a company that sells four different sizes of MP3 players and four different sizes of notebooks. They have one size of tablet. Uh, I think it makes sense to me that an 8-inch version would be coming. And exactly what Ayaz said, you want to compete with the fire before the fire becomes a surprise hit on the Nook and all of these other devices that play that do live in that middle ground. Now, I don't see Apple probably going into like the 5 point whatever inch uh, area like the Galaxy Note, but um, a smaller tablet, you know, why not? Well, I think Shave the iPhone fifty dollars well, off of it. The iPhone five would be five inches, and then <laughs> we get an iPad Mini at eight inches. Then you're, you're not that far away. Uh, we we may find out Wednesday, March seventh. Uh, iMore, citing sources, uh, says that is the day that Apple will make the next iPad announcement. Uh, the Loop also agrees, and once the Loop uh, weighed in, a lot of people started weighing in as well, saying, "Yep, that sounds good to me." March seventh. So Apple hasn't made any announcement, but it sounds like maybe. Uh, that's a, a fairly accurate rumor. They may not be able to sell any more iPads, though, if ProView gets uh, their way. Right, Sarah? Yeah, this is a this is kind of a crazy story and not seeming to be going in Apple's favor at all. Um, Apple and ProView Shenzhen, so it's the Shenzhen branch of ProView, their computer display maker, have been in a trademark battle for about two years. Um, Apple ended up suing ProView back in 2010, claiming we own the iPad name because Apple says it bought ProView's worldwide rights to the iPad trademark in 10 different countries several years ago, and now ProView is refusing to honor this agreement. Agreement. ProView says, no, 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 we're not bound by a deal that was made by our Taiwanese affiliate to license the name. So it's a little bit of a, you know, who said, uh, who's right? Not he said, she said necessarily. Um, so the, the deal is, is that um, Apple sued ProView last November. That was rejected. They appealed. That was rejected in December. And now, because of Chinese laws um, that can prohibit counterfeit, good, uh, counterfeit goods like clothing, movies, music, electronics, whatever, from being exported from China, ProView can technically demand seizure and ban of iPad exports. You say, okay, well... The law meant to stop a Louis Vuitton purse leaving China without Louis Vuitton's permission might keep the iPads in China? Sure, yeah. I mean, it, it's well, it's importing and exporting. So you go, yeah. okay, well, maybe iPads can't be in, uh, sold within China. But iPads are made in China. Yeah. All iPads are made in China. So if no, no iPads can be exported, that affects global sales. That affects that affects everybody. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a big deal. Um, ProView is facing known financial troubles. So you could think of it as, wow, they really want to shut Apple down. 
in my opinion, they don't want to shut Apple down. They want a very, very, very big settlement because Apple is in a vulnerable position right now. They are about to announce a new iPad. They have to be able to sell it um, in all their big markets. Uh, Xinhua News uh, Agency out of China has reported ProView could seek up to 10 billion won, which is about 1.6 billion US dollars. So it's a lot of money at stake. And, and you know, again, Apple's Apple's in crunch mode right now. They can't. They can't be tied up legally, uh, appealing too much longer. So um, ProView doesn't want to stop iPads from being made. They just want to shake down Apple's cash reserves for a little money. That's the general consensus. Okay. Uh, yesterday, we had reported the iPads were being confiscated from a retailer um, in a, a city in the Hebei province, and a ProView lawyer also told the AP that the company has asked authorities in more than 20 cities to investigate, destroy promotional materials that violate this trademark. Now, we haven't seen any uh, any stories about Apple products being pulled off of Apple Store shelves in China, um, although ProView has filed a trademark infringement case against Apple in Shanghai, trying to halt iPad sales there. And that case isn't scheduled uh, to begin until the 22nd of this month. So, it's it's a real mess. I, I, I see Apple having to fork over a lot of money unless they've got something up their sleeve that they just haven't brought into a courtroom until now. Well, in, in, back in April of last year, Foxconn said they were setting up a, a, a factory in Brazil that would make iPads. So iPads wouldn't be completely gone from the market, but they would become, I would imagine, extremely rare because China's where the majority of them are made. But I mean, this it looks like Apple probably will pay money for this. But the question is, will it be worth less to them to start up a business somewhere else? I mean, they don't have to even stay at Foxconn or stay anywhere near China, considering all the, the flack they're taking for uh, being doing business with these factories that seem to have uh, questionable work habits. Yeah, so Foxconn they, has a manufacturing plant in Brazil, uh, and there are other manufacturers in Taiwan that Apple does business with. So the question is, would they be able to manufacture the iPad in great enough quantities mm -hmm. uh, to satisfy that? Plus, it's, is, it's a huge problem on their business. Go ahead, Chris. This is how American manufacturing is coming back, guys. Didn't Clint Eastwood do anything at the Super Second Bowl? Second half. This is it. It's halftime, America. iPads. And we're going to sue Apple into making iPads in Detroit again. Um, well, no, I, I think ProView is, you know, legitimately going to try to stop this company, Apple, from making knockoffs of their very valuable brand iPad. Well, yeah, don't you? Uh, we all have ProView iPads here. Yeah. And, you know, that's the first thing I think of when I think iPad, ProView. Yeah. Absolutely. But does anyone remember the uh, Linksys iPhone that came out about six months before the Apple iPhone came out? I do. Out? Mm -hmm. I remember that. And yeah. I remember they actually they paid Linksys for that, or Cisco yeah. for that, that uh, name. And I think before that iPad was, I want to say, a Fujitsu product. It was an actual, this weird Windows CE device. So you can, you can always negotiate. Yeah. And, and what, what, did, what I, I, Sarah, I think you nailed it, which is this company has licensed or, or at least not have fought this before and, until they got cash strapped. And that's why, yeah. they're, that's why they're pressing it now. Uh, I, I expect this to come to a pretty quick deal. Other what, news what, what's, what's unique about this, and this will just be the last thing I say, is companies do these sorts of things when they get desperate, but the court seemed to be going um, the way of ProView, at least in China. So, I mean, it must be extremely frustrating for Apple. Yeah, exactly. Well, ProView has a decent case in China. Uh, mm -hmm. That's 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 the key there. Also happening in Asia, uh, Yahoo and Alibaba uh, talks to split the company out. Remember, Yahoo owns a big chunk of Alibaba, but apparently those deals have fallen. Those the talks have fallen apart. Kara Swisher at All Things D reporting that the uh, the talks are off for now. Sources said they halted over an arrangement with China's Alibaba Group and Japan's SoftBank designed to save Yahoo four billion dollars in taxes. Now we're not going to get into the complexity of the deal and all the uh, the financial arrangements being discussed, but the sources characterized the talks as completely stopped because Yahoo negotiators are shifting course on what they want from the arrangement. Probably not that surprising, considering that they have a new CEO and a new board of directors that they might want to change their tactics in these negotiations. The rumored deal up to now would have involved swapping Yahoo's ownership in Alibaba and Yahoo Japan back to those companies, SoftBank in the case of Yahoo Japan, uh, to in, in a trade for some still-to-be-determined assets that would then have tax savings for Yahoo. Uh, so th this, I, I don't know how much it's really going to affect us, except that the longer that this drags out, the less focus Yahoo has on their domestic products. Yeah, this kind of divestiture, getting rid of these other pro uh, properties would let Yahoo decide, okay, what do we do anyway? I mean, they have a new CEO, they need a direction, but if they're, they're constantly trying to figure out what's the best tax, tax plan, you're not going to see any like 
real movement, like exciting movement with Yahoo. And we're pretty much in a holding pattern when it comes to what does Yahoo do? I still don't know. Well, it seems like the shareholders really hope that they'll do that that they'll do something different. I know Kara Swisher had had noted in her article on all things D originally, hey, stock's up. It's pretty high. And then she had to uh, release an update. Well, now that the news is out that some some decision has been stalled, stock's back down. Chris, you were going to say you worked at Yahoo for years. I worked at Yahoo for four years, and uh, I still don't know what Yahoo does. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Well, what they do is they fight proxy fights, apparently, because Dan Loeb has finally started his expected proxy fight with the new board of directors. So that's going to make life even more interesting for him. Let's take a quick break and thank our sponsor, Squarespace.com. I use Squarespace every day. Used it last night uh, to publish the Sword and Laser blog. We use it on my podcast, Sword and Laser. It's so easy. I take, I, I have a Google Doc that we have our lineup in. I copy all of the links and headlines. I paste it into the Squarespace interface, and it's so quick to go and take all that stuff and turn it into links, turn it into bold headings, and publish those show notes out. Uh, I do it all the time, and that's why I use Squarespace for Sword and Laser. Also, great looking. I mean, uh, using those templates and modifying them, put a little artwork in there, you got yourself a prime website. So check out squarespace.com. Whether you're a beginner, whether you want to import your old blog, because you can import blogs into Squarespace, no, no risk. They'll let you take it back out, too. Uh, and you get to, to try it out for free. You don't even need a credit card. So there's no reason not to give it a shot if you haven't yet. Squarespace.com gives you reliable serving. Uh, so you don't have to worry that your site's going to go down. They give you 24-7 support. Uh, free live classes. If you're like, you know, I'm, I'm still uncertain. How about blogging? They'll do everything for every level of user from the person who wants to tweak the CSS themselves to the person who knows nothing. Try them out absolutely free. Try out a free account. No need to put a credit card in. Just go there and create a blog right now. If you decide to purchase it, remember this code, TNT2, and get 15% off for six months. That's squarespace.com. Use that offer code TNT2. We thank them for their support of Tech News Today. On to a new service that will allow you to pay for something you can get for free. Well, maybe you can get it for free. But it's, it, the service is called Aereo. It's launching March 14th. You probably heard of them before as Bamboom Labs. And what it's going to do is going to stream New York City-based television to New York City-based users uh, using an HTML5 compatible browser. So you just need to have Chrome or basically anything. It's going to cost you 12 bucks a month starting March 14th, and you get a 30-day free trial. Now, how this works is pretty simple. They have miniaturized antennas. And what they are effectively doing is they're renting out this each antenna to each user. This is how they're, they're trying to get around whole legal issues. So they're not broadcasting. No. You're renting a particular. You're renting yeah. out. A, right. You're renting out an antenna, and they give you a cloud DVR, so you can just record things like from ABC, CBS, Fox, NBC directly through this service. Now, if you're wondering, hey, how can I get this anywhere? Well, this is really limited to New York City, and I asked uh, Aereo. And they, they actually sent a response. An area spokesperson told me that you have to have a New York City billing address uh, tied to your credit card, and it looks for your IP, ad- IP address to determine your location. If that IP address is outside of the New York City area, it allows you to geolocate your position via GPS to confirm that you are, in fact, in New York City. Now, they're but, gonna, the, but the point of that is if you're outside of the New York City broadcast area, they're not going to let you watch the That's TV correct. Channels. And yeah. I think that, that's a lot of – this has to do with a lot of the legal wrangling when it comes to this to make sure they don't get sued out of existence – they're not doing anything you couldn't do with an antenna. And what they're, the, the idea is simple. If you're in New York City and the way that the digital transmissions work nowadays, if you don't have line of sight necessarily, you're not going to get as good a signal. It used to be in the old days, you'd have analog. It would go through buildings very easily. But if you don't have that kind of line of sight, you lose out a little bit. Now, there, there have been improvements to that over the years as we move to digital, but it's not exactly great. So if you're facing the wrong side in your building, you're not going to get over the air. Basically, local channels don't want you to watch any channel outside of the area because they mm-hmm. that affects their ratings. Mm-hmm. They want all the people in the area to only be able to watch their version of NBC, not the one in Chicago or the one in Ottawa or the you know wherever else. Uh, Ottawa is a horrible example. They're in Canada. They're going to have CBC. But anyway, you get the picture. Uh, so so that's why they do this strict. Netflix, iTunes, they don't have to worry about that because they're giving you a show. It's not based on local television or local television broadcast. And uh, Aereo is citing a 2008 precedent about uh, cloud DVRs with uh, cable vision to see if they can get away with doing this. And and they're, they're riding the line here. Now, Bam Boom has been around for a while, actually. I mean, we've reported on them in the past. And so they didn't get sued out of existence yet. And the question is, will they be able to survive? Uh, they have an interesting financial backer, uh, Barry Diller, 
He created Fox, the broadcast network. So it's not like he's doesn't he's unfamiliar with uh, with television. He's also on the board of Aereo. Really, not, not sure exactly yeah, how Dillers Dillers a TV executive has been around forever. Yeah, so he's he's involved in a lot of properties. The question is, what kind of uh, influence he will have. I, I, I don't know if he'll have like Fox contacts to say, hey, don't sue us guys. But that's, I mean, that's all speculative. Uh, but it he's looks got like- contacts though. You can, you can bet on that. Whether they're at Fox or not doesn't really matter. He's yeah. got plenty of contacts. So, so if anybody can have some influence to pull this off, it would be Barry Diller, but he's just on the board. That's right. right. Right, so he's, he's basically, I guess... Not an employee. A, right, he's on the board, so he's, all the decisions have to come up, basically about stockholders and you know, all that fun stuff with boards, like we talked about with Yahoo. But obviously, if this succeeds in New York City, you could imagine this easily rolling out to other cities, satellite cities, because it's if they follow, with, if they follow the rules, they can get away with this. And this is actually, I think, intriguing because... There are a lot of times where you should be able to receive a signal and you should legally be allowed to do that, but you physically can't. And if there's a service you get around that, 12 bucks a month, not so bad. Sarah, you're a cord cutter. I mean, you want this? It, I, I, okay, my first, my first reaction was $12 a month for something that my over-the-air antenna can pretty much already cover. I don't know about that, especially if you've got... Uh, services that do promise well okay so the, i was going to say the boxy live tv dongle which does not allow for dvr capabilities on live tv yet although that they say that they're working on it um i like the idea of maybe paying once for the for the equipment but then you know if the over the air signal is free kind of bugs me to have that 12 dollars a month recurring fee i understand the why they have to price it the way that they do if i can get this through my roku box now i'm really interested because that is not only just a convenience where I don't have to keep switching inputs on my television, but then all of a sudden I've got a DVR inside my Roku interface for live television that I'm watching more and more. Apple TV is cool too, but that also that will just leave out people who aren't on iOS devices to be able to airplay it to an Apple TV. Now, Aereo is working. They do have a Roku app that will be coming out. So they're going. So you can do this on browsers. You can do this on Roku, Apple TV, iPhone, Android, pretty much anything. So. I, I, they pretty much have it all covered. So the question is, well, can they survive? And, and can they move beyond broadcast? I mean, is the is the end game here to move this into cable services and to have a la carte, whatever you want, TV channels over the air? That probably couldn't happen. Well, I would never say never. Okay, they're not going to be able to problem? just do it uh, without permission. But I think what you can do is if you get enough people subscribed to this, go to the cable networks that aren't getting the best deals, the ones who are actually having to pay for cable carriage, the ones that aren't part of larger networks and have a hard time get, you know, getting any eyeballs in, in 300 channel lineups and say, hey, we're going to give you prime, prime real estate with a bunch of people that are watching stuff. And, and so it might not start with the best channels, but you may get some cable channels saying, yeah, I'd like to be a part of that if they get a big enough footprint, if this catches on. And then once you get enough people, then you can start talking to the ESPNs, to the home and gardens, to the, to the larger networks and say, you know what, we've got, we've got a footprint. Once you've got enough people watching, the cable companies aren't going to care anymore as long as they can make their money off of it. I was going to take a pretty right. forward-thinking cable company to do that, uh, or cable station, that is, because there are all kinds of rules for a, a cable system, that, like for FCC rules that apply to a cable system nationwide versus, uh, versus something like what, what Aereo is doing. That's one of the reasons why they should be technically allowed to do this is I don't think they're a cable system. I have to double-check the law on that one. But it's, there are certain rules that once you start doing national things and you start bringing national programming, that's when certain things might apply to a company like this that they might not want. Yeah, but they're not. They're providing regional they, by definition, they are, they are geolocating you, they are IP fencing you, and they're saying this is a regional. Now, they can provide many different regional services, Good but point. that's no different than a cable company. We'll have to see if that works. Yeah. I, I would expect that it would. Mm. All right. Uh, real quickly, a new uh, leak of BlackBerry 10 OS images has surfaced at CrackBerry.com. Uh, they show the addition of widgets to the home screen. Uh, an updated icon tray with new icons, options for video chat. These all seem to have come from a document prepared by one of RIM's external ad agency partners as a way to brief potential partners and, and advertising associates uh, about BlackBerry 10. I kind of think this looks like last year's operating system, though. It's okay. So this it doesn't is, look bad. This is a BlackBerry 10. It's based on QNX, the same operating system that's on the playbook. It's supposed to be a miniaturized version of that. Uh, it doesn't look uh, super interesting, unfortunately. Like we're, they're not—they're not coming out until September. BlackBerry 10 phones. So we still have 
several months to go. So maybe this is an early build. Maybe there'll be some like whiz bang amazing feature that we just didn't see. But effectively, they're playing catch up. Just like a people hub, which is pretty much from WebOS from like 2000. I don't know what nine. Uh, then there's uh, there's what what else is in this thing? Oh, new icons. So I I can't get excited about this. Yeah, this looks. I mean, some of the shots look like any Android or iOS home screen and then you've got stuff that looks a little bit like windows phone and that gets me uh, feeling like okay well blackberry's catching up yeah they're, they're gonna have a cool interface that a lot of people already enjoy and have come to expect but again like i have said this is like later this year so if we're already seeing stuff that we go yeah it looks better then by the end of the year they've really got to like step it up or else Think think of how much more everyone else will have advanced by September potentially. It just it's a it's a catch up game and they can't really play forever. Chris, now give us some BlackBerry hope. I I saw those widgets and I thought immediately, you got your mango in my BlackBerry. <laughs> <laughs> mm, that actually sounds really, like a smoothie. Mm. <laughs> the only thing anyone cares about BlackBerry right now is, like, is that that has a keyboard. If it, as long as it's got a good keyboard, the BlackBerry faithful will stick with it. And uh, they will they will love the new icons and the widgets and uh, uh, you know the the people hub and uh, and that that will be that. Um, I mean, it's like everyone has said this is old hat for everyone else who's been with smartphones and touchscreens for forever. But if you can keep uh, keep the BlackBerry users hanging in there, then then BlackBerry will never go away. Yeah, don't underestimate the loyalty of BlackBerry users. I, I know people are like, there's no email client like that. that's on my BlackBerry, that's on my Android phone. I cannot get the same kind of email. So maybe... What was I get it? the same email. Well, the same Honestly. kind of email anyway, not the exact same email. But the, 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 <laughs> the idea is, is, okay, well, the plan was, is it, uh, is it Hines? Is that his name? The, the CEO of the... That Thorsten? Ex, yeah, Thorsten will have... Uh, his plan is that existing BlackBerry owners will upgrade. So they will be saved by their existing people finally cisco has released a report on future mobile data usage they do this from time to time and they've been fairly accurate in the past they're saying for the next five years total global mobile data traffic will increase 18 fold by 2016 when it will reach 130 exabytes that's 18 times larger than last year's mobile traffic uh, most of it will come from the cloud streaming from the cloud will account for 71 percent of all mobile traffic now 4g will only account for six percent of mobile connections by 2016 but that is expected to generate 36 percent of the mobile traffic 10 billion mobile internet connected devices in 2016 that's more than one per person in fact by the end of this year by the end of 2012 they expect that the number of mobile connected devices will exceed the number of people on earth so by 2016, there will be 1.4 mobile devices per capita. Now, pair this with a couple of other reports out there, and I want to get everybody's opinion on this. Round the horn. J.P. Morgan analyst Mark Moskowitz says Ultrabooks will not take off until they sink to the $600 to $800 price point. So Ultrabooks are not going to take off this year. They may take off in 2013. We'll see. PCs are still the biggest money makers around, bringing in about 19% of the reported $144 billion in hardware sales last year, although revenue for PCs is declining, while revenue for tablets and smartphones is rising. So is, is, the, is the, the reign of the mobile device at hand? Are we going to be saying nobody uses desktops except for specialty appliances? Uh, laptops are on the wane. It's all going to be at the at the most an ultrabook, and everybody's going to be doing tablets and mobile devices. Sarah Lane, what do you think? Well, I I think ultrabooks are too expensive. If ultrabooks could come down in price just a couple hundred dollars, so that they weren't often more expensive than, let's say, an entry level power uh, um, power book, then or. I'm sorry, uh, MacBook Air, then you, it's, it's not as if people aren't interested in Ultrabooks because it's just sort of the same old argument of like, will tablets replace laptops? Well, no, they don't replace laptops for me. I can only use my iPad for certain things, but not for everything. That said, um, there, I think there are going to be certain, especially in emerging markets, certain areas of the globe, if we're talking global numbers, that will bypass laptops completely and they're going to go completely to mobile and that's why we see these crazy big numbers more mobile devices this year than there are people in the world continuing for the next four years i yeah i, I don't i don't think that laptops are going away pcs i think are on the decline 
unless you're in special situations where you need to, I don't know, crunch hefty data, video editing, and that sort of thing. Chris Null, what do you think? We go in mobile, we're going to stay the course and split the difference. I think the real test is seen in that graph that you had up earlier that shows what the tablet growth has been over one year. And it said something like 5% market share in 2010 and like 11% in 2011. It's the only thing that is skyrocketing upward in popularity. Um, and it's, it's hard for us, I think, as a group here to think about what this really means because we are on laptops all day. We use tablets. We use smartphones. We're kind of, uh, we kind of have this hodgepodge of devices that we turn to for each different thing we want to do. But if you look at a younger market, and like Sarah said, you look at emerging markets, uh, they are bypassing laptops. And I think about my nine-year-old daughter and she doesn't, use a, she doesn't use a laptop for really anything except when she wants to type uh, something for school. Everything else is done on an iPad or an iPod Touch. And uh, she's very comfortable there. Uh, but when it comes to a physical keyboard, she's, she's just not interested. Uh, so, yeah, when she goes to high school, she's probably going to be using a laptop to write reports. But all of her research and everything else is always going to be on the tablet. And uh, as these things get more and more popular, yeah, there it is. As these get more, as tablets get more capable, powerful, and popular, that's only going to continue. So I think we look at it from a bubble because I think, how could I ever live without my laptop? And, and I really couldn't. But uh, there's a whole lot of people out there that are, that are taking us over demographically that can. I, as do you agree? I think PCs are going to stay for the enthusiasts and those who like to tinker with their devices. But I think uh, uh, computers have turned almost into a consumer electronic at this point. It used to be where it was only for nerds and you really wanted to play with your device. Now it's like, look, I don't care if it's sealed. I don't care if I can't upgrade it. I don't care. I just want it to work the way I want it. And so people want to always be connected while they're moving around. So with the advances in laptop technology with, with processors, how fast they've gotten, even in something like an Ultrabook, you can pretty much do everything you want on, on such a slim device. I think that the mobile stuff is... That's, that's just flat out the future. The, the, the days of having a desktop, like in every house, I don't think that's going to be... That's not long for this world unless you're a gamer and you love doing that kind of thing or you want to tinker with the inside of a device. I think these are just becoming consumer electronics. Yeah, I think desktop's mostly gone. I, I think the big difference, the thing that needs to be cracked before a mobile device can replace this laptop for me is that I have to be able to switch very quickly between programs and see parts of the programs at the same time. Sounds really simple, but every Windows machine, every OS X machine, every Linux machine can do that. And iOS, Android, and the other uh, mobile operating systems cannot. Uh, so I will need both until someone comes up with some new magic form factor or operating system metaphor that allows me to do what I do with fast switching between windows. I just I, I, I can't do the same things on a tablet in the same way and with the same efficiency that I do on a laptop. Maybe I'm just old and I, I can't change my ways. I don't know. But uh, that, that's the one thing that's holding me back. Let's Tom, move. you will have you will have two tablets. That's how it will work. Eventually. You know, the I've carrier. actually done that before, but I can't copy and paste from one to the other. <laughs> Somebody built in the car yet? Oh, yeah. they'll figure that out, Tom. Give them time. Let's figure out the news feeds. Congratulations, Facebook! You've hit the big time. Angry Birds: The Modern Day Doom has arrived, uh, finally making its debut on Facebook as an app. This version of the game has exclusive levels, and you can share your scores and send gifts to friends. Free power-ups are available now through the 16th. Get a mother hut. MIT has set up a new prototype electronics course where you can study and be graded completely online. So starting in March. Anybody from anywhere in the world will have access to the MITx project. This is an accredited course, and MIT spokesperson said, this is a real course, you guys, not some watered-down version. And in that vein, expect to work at least 10 hours a week until June. Pocket now has pictures or renders of Motorola's first ice cream sandwich-powered phone. From the outside, the design looks like a departure from the current look of Moto phones. But the real story is on the inside. The unnamed device would be powered by an Intel Medfield chip. And don't forget, Intel and Motorola announced a partnership back at CES. Oh, man, because all the Valentine's Day candy, I thought you were going to say that the, the surprise on the inside was a creamy... Sentence. It's nougat. Uh, it's nougat. Zynga Earnings Day. This is yeah. their first earnings since the IPO. Is that right? Or maybe the second? I'm not sure. But the company reported revenue was $307 million 
up 59% compared to the fourth quarter of 2010, which is right after they IPO'd. Uh, they beat expectations by two cents a share. That didn't please Wall Street, though, because in after hour trading, Zynga's stock price has taken a small hit. But it's definitely uh, better than their fourth quarter report. Wall Street Journal is reporting that Nortel Networks was hacked for about 10 years by a group in China. Company documents like emails, R&D reports, and others were stolen after the hackers obtained passwords from Nortel executives in the year 2000. According to former Nortel security advisor Brian Shields, the company did not adequately defend itself. You think, Brian? The company subsequently went bankrupt. The sale of the sale of its patents to a consortium, including Apple and Microsoft, was approved by the DOJ yesterday. Pocket Lint reports HTC will be well, one of the first companies outside of Sony to get PlayStation certification and says the announcement will come out later this year. The PS certification program for Android devices was announced back in uh, at the introduction of the Vita and uh, the HTC device would be, again, the first outside of Sony. Don't forget, I think the tablet has certification and a couple of their phones. There's a new Facebook app for Windows Phone by Microsoft. It now supports group ad pages, but doesn't add an easy way to check in or tag people. It also doesn't fully support the Facebook timeline, but then what does these days? And it does have a better panorama mode, at least that's what Microsoft says. According to Bloomberg, Netflix has ordered 13 episodes of Orange is the New Black, which is a comedy from Genji Kohan, the director of Showtime's Weeds. You might have heard of it, and if you've heard of it, you might really like it. The show is based on the memoir of a communications executive who served time for drug charges in a woman's prison. Scalato plans to show off a new iOS and Android photo editing app at Mobile World Congress. Now, the app allows you to remove items from the background in a photo. So if you wanted to take a picture of someone in particular and there's people in the background, you can eliminate those people simply by tapping those people out of existence. Look at that. Boom. Oh, they're Stalin gone. Stalin would have loved that. I, well, yes. It's, 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 instead of having to do some fancy Photoshop, this app is supposed to take care of it for you. So I'm really intrigued by this. We'll see it in a couple of weeks. On to the randomizer. Randomizer. Students have created the ultimate hockey player, an autonomous humanoid robot named Jennifer. Okay. Oh, is that not enough for you? That, uh, well, I want to see some video. We're getting the video from Uni University you know, of Manitoba. There's some crappy robots out there. It's a hockey playing robot already. I mean, Whoa. That, that's that's well. Now it's not skating. Okay, so it's walking on the. Uh, oh no, it's just, it is skating. It looks like hey, it's skating extremely. Walking slow. on ice is skating. <laughs> that is. Well, wow. no, wait a second. There are blades. It looks like, and and Jennifer is capable of scoring a goal. I'm a big fan of hockey. So I guess I have a soft spot Jennifer for can puck handle, skate, shoot somewhat accurately, so probably good enough to play for the Blues. Her slap shot certainly doesn't rival that of, you know, major stars like Gretzky or anything, but uh, yes. a little street hockey. It's a first step in robo yeah. hockey. Actually, that looks like the hockey we used to play in the basement of my friend Jeff Hallmark's house when I was in junior high. You guys were robots? Uh, we were. We, okay. well, we were about as good as Jennifer, let's put it that way. That's why it reminds me of that. Uh, hey, Jennifer's I a better ice skater than I am. Hockey overlords. <laughs> welcome our hockey overlords. I welcome our robot hockey overlords as well. Let's move on to the calendar. The Document Foundation has released LibreOffice 3.5. Calc gets a big upgrade. Microsoft Video Visio files can now be imported. Uh, some automatic updates um, have gotten have gotten a little refresh and more. Free and open source. What's not to like? RIM's extending their offer for free playbooks for developers that submit apps to BlackBerry's app world. So now you want to participate and thought you were too late, you have until February 15th to register and until March 2nd to submit an app. RIM says, as of last week, 6,600 devs have signed up and 1,500 apps were submitted. So free playbooks, get on that. If you've pre-ordered a PS Vita, PlayStation Vita, of course, uh, midnight launch events are being held uh, around the U.S. at Sony's flagship store in Manhattan and various GameStop locations. You can buy the first edition bundle which is the Wi-Fi 3G console, special edition hard case, four gigabyte memory card, and a copy of Little Deviant. It's a $350 bundle. The rest of you have to wait until the 22nd when the unbundled console goes on sale. Um, and if you don't want to go anywhere at midnight, then the pre-orders are available tomorrow as well. T-Mobile is holding an event to show off what it calls its latest and greatest on March 15th in Washington, D.C. Invitation clearly displays a seven, uh, so people figure uh, it's probably something BlackBerry 7 related. Yep. Nah, it's probably not Yawn. anything BlackBerry 10. 
The Verge is guessing it's a uh, uh, T-Mobile Curve uh, 9380, perhaps, or maybe some new BlackBerry 7 features. And finally, Twisted Metal hits the USA Today exclusively for the PlayStation 3, at least for now, for 60 bucks. Let's check what's incoming. Incoming message. Got an interesting proposition on voicemail, or an interesting observation, rather, about MySpace. Hi, this is Itello, the charismatic geek. Anyway, so I think you're forgetting about the fact that Justin Timberlake is a pop idol. They can go up one million users in a short amount of time. You're forgetting about the pop aspect of it. They could parlay what they're doing into something more. Think about it. All right, all right fair, fair point, E. Kello. Uh, although, if you have to call yourself charismatic, are you? I don't know. Uh, but... Once Okay, so Justin Timberlake tweets out like, hey, MySpace just added this hot new feature and it was going to get a bunch of people to follow him, right? Whether it's Twitter mm -hmm. or whatever mm -hmm. social network. But Sarah, do you think that they'll stay? Well, I think that Justin Timberlake being on board with MySpace might account for a lot of their user growth in the last month. I know that Justin Timberlake's a celebrity. A lot of people follow him. So, yeah, I mean, an, a, a, a famous person who endorses a product and then... Justin Timberlake's case is actually co-owner of MySpace now. Yeah, I mean, you're responsible for that initial push, but you're not going to keep getting the, the more and more fans coming to the product. I mean, you, you actually have to have something that works, or even those people who moved over because of you will eventually drop off. Well, MySpace has that music hook. I mean, Timberlake could release singles on there exclusively or have his friends put up stuff there too, uh, maybe off a contract, some kind of thing there. That would keep people coming back or keep it buzzworthy. Go, oh, look, MySpace actually has songs that Spotify, iTunes, these places don't have. Give you a reason to come back or even join MySpace. So I'm thinking that's the kind of thing he could bring that a lot of people couldn't. Chris, I want you to put yourself in a, a strange headspace. Let's say that you love the music of Justin Timberlake. Would that be it? You know, replace Justin Timberlake with a musician that you absolutely love, unless you love Justin Timberlake. Would that be enough to drive you over there? Well, I, I use MySpace when there are bands on there that right. I know have music that I want to listen to. Sometimes it is exclusive to MySpace, but uh, that doesn't, I mean, I am reluctant, reluctant to even have to log into MySpace, and I wouldn't even be able to tell you what my user account or password are. All this does really to me is make me think Justin Timberlake is less cool. Aww. Aww. Poor Justin. I know, I know he's feeling bad about and that. And on too. Valentine's Day. Chris. That was cool. Really? <laughs> no, I, 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 I think MySpace is doing the right thing. And I think they're going to take a lot of flack because it's easy to say, MySpace, they're so over. They lost to Facebook. And it's easy to throw stones at Justin Timberlake if you're not a fan. But... Uh, having him on board is smart. Uh, focusing on music is smart. And, and as Chris said, people still uh, have to go to MySpace for certain music. So they, they have an audience. I, I think it's, uh, and I think E. Kello is bringing up a good point, which is, you know, that celebrity factor shouldn't be ignored. Let's move on to the email. Sarah, you want to get the email for us? Sure. Damien Dellinger writes, I make licensed collegiate apparel and all collegiate licensees must be members of the FLA. So I have a little knowledge about how membership in the FLA works. I had asked yesterday, is it voluntary? How, how do people get involved if it's not mandatory? Membership in the FLA entails an entire organization and all its suppliers through its supply chain. It's not a pick and choose which factories you want covered. If you have a vendor, their labor conditions must meet FLA standards. It requires full disclosure of manufacturing sites and suppliers. It's about transparency. Membership is voluntary, but compliance is not. As a collegiate licensee, membership is not voluntary. If you want to make officially licensed collegiate merchandise, you must be a member and you must be compliant. That said, my own personal view is that Apple's membership in the FLA is a move to get the thumbs up from institutions of higher learning to entering into deeper hardware relationships with them. Not being a member of the FLA wouldn't fly. I don't know this for a fact, but I'd bet that all existing textbook manufacturers have good labor conditions. They're probably domestic, even if they're not members of the FLA. That's an interesting take I had yeah. not heard about before. So, yes, Apple absolutely wants to be involved in education, not just for selling MacBooks, but for selling textbooks. So if universities are going to say, well, we'd, we'd love to involve you in our textbook industry, but you have to follow FLA, and Apple's looking at all these people saying, you know, you need to treat things better in China, it makes perfect sense for them to sign up with the FLA. In okay. fact, I, you know, I, I certainly don't have any insider information, but... 
they might have always intended to have a good relationship with the FLA long before. Well, the Foxconn stuff has been going on for a long time, but independent of these issues. And it just worked in the press to say, look, Apple's responding to the outrage by joining the FLA when they may have already had plans. For everyone asking, FLA stands for Fair Labor Association. So and, there you go. And also Florida, but not in this case. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, liberal man. Uh, any, any thoughts on this, uh, Chris, before we head out of here? No, I think you nailed it. I mean, if I had a lot of bad press coming like a tidal wave, then this is a good way to deflect some of that. Yeah, good stuff. Thanks for the uh, the insight. Yeah. That's that's why I love our audience uh, because people like Demian will, you know, they know they everybody has an industry or an association or an area of experience that they know better than anybody else. And and when we all send in stuff like this, it just helps everybody else. So keep that kind of insight coming. Appreciate it, and keep. Chris Null Insight coming. Chris, great to have you on the show again. Uh, let folks know where they can find you online and uh, read the Intuit blog and all that good stuff. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. It's uh, blog.intuit.com. It's all about small business. There you go. Easy as that. Blog.intuit.com. Are you are you on Google Plus as well, or are you not you're really using that? I am. I don't I do not do a lot on it, though. I, I'm, uh, I'm still waiting for uh, somebody to accept my Circles invitation. Uh, no, is it me? No, I just, yeah, it's just, it's a ghost down there, isn't it? Not really, no. I, I've, I've got a bunch of people that I, I, I keep up on, but yeah, it's not, I don't know. It's a different... It's no MySpace, that's why. It's, it's no MySpace. They mean Justin Timberlake. <laughs> really yeah. All right, don't forget to uh, submit your stories that you'd like to hear us talk about or just vote on the things that other people have submitted at our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com. Uh, you can find that, all kinds of good stories there, actually. Check it out, technewstoday.reddit.com. Thanks to everybody who's in there helping us out. We look at it every day. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us. Our email address is TNT at twit.tv. Or you can give us a call. Our phone number is, I almost give my own phone number out there for a second, 260-TNT-SHOW. <laughs> Randall Bennett joins us tomorrow. We'll see you then.